Great, wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today for Materials to the Rescue. Uh, this is part one of the Innovation in Materials and Manufacturing series. I'm Jennifer Souter, Director of Patents and Licensing at WISIS. For those of you that aren't familiar with WISIS, we're a nonprofit supporting organization of the UW system. And at WISIS, we support research, we market ideas, we inspire students, faculty, and alumni, and we build culture, all with the goal of inspiring Wisconsin innovation. It's been my pleasure to work in partnership with colleagues at the Regional Manu Materials and Manufacturing Network, or the RM2N, to present this virtual series this week. I'd like to take this opportunity to quickly acknowledge a few of our team members who have made today possible. From WISIS, I'd like to thank Tony Hansen, our Regional and Licensing Associate, and Craig Sauer, our Marketing and Communications Associate. Craig, Tony, thanks very much for your help today. I'd also like to thank Gokal Gopal, co-director of the RM2N, for serving on our planning committee and helping to make this series a success. I'd also like to thank partners at the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center at UW-Madison for sponsoring the prizes for tomorrow's student showcase. So today you're going to be hearing all about materials to the rescue and specifically how Wisconsin companies and universities have responded to the challenges that have been presented by the coronavirus pandemic. Before I get started, I would like to turn things over to my colleague Gokul to say a few words on behalf of the RM2N. Gokul? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Gokul Gopal. I'm the incoming director of the Regional Materials and Manufacturing Network, or the RM2N. Uh, the RM2N is a network focused in areas relating to material science and engineering, as well as their applications to manufacturing processes and manufacturing technologies. Uh, the network brings together faculty, staff, and students from across the UW system, as well as industry partners from around the state. Our efforts are primarily targeted at reducing inefficiency in research and development, uh, primarily by streamlining collaboration across our various campuses as well as with industry. Uh, we're happy to partner with WISIS to bring you this event. Over the next three days, uh, we hope to highlight some of the innovative approaches that faculty, staff, students, and businesses have come up with in dealing with the repercussions and the limitations of operating do during a global pandemic. So I'll put my contact information in the chat. If anyone has any questions about the RM2N, please feel free to reach out to me. And I think with that, I'll hand it back to Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks very much, Gokul. Now, without further ado, I am really delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Lori Schaefer from Kimberly Clark. Lori is the Senior Director of Research and Development within the Global Nonwovens Division at Kimberly Clark. And she's responsible for delivering innovative materials that drive growth for brands such as Huggies, Depend, and Kotex. And she has over 20 years of industry experience that spans R&D, supply chain, marketing, sustainability, both in the US and internationally. And there's really a focus on creating value through being the first to market with consumer preferred innovation. Lori, we're delighted to have you here today and I'll now turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. Really happy to be here. And um, yeah, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm really excited about this topic because I think there's some really great stories um, that have happened since COVID uh, kind of took over the world in March of last year. And the story that I'm gonna share with you today is about Kimberly Clark's COVID response. Um, there's many examples that we can pull from, but this is one that I found to be um, most relevant because we did leverage material innovation to meet some emerging consumer needs that I think you'll all be very familiar with based on your experiences. So if you can advance it. I want to start with just an overview of Kimberly Clark because I know some may be familiar and some may not. So we are a $19 billion company that was founded in 1872. We've got a lot of brands that you're likely very uh, familiar with, including five uh, billion dollar plus brands, uh, which would be Huggies, Kleenex, Kotex, Cottonelle, and Scott. So I know I can't see you guys on video, but I'm assuming if I could see a show of hands, there are probably quite a few of you who uh, were out of toilet paper at one point or another over the course of the last year. So, so we did our very best as an organization. Uh, we were one of the primary suppliers um, in the US. And so um, hopefully you were able to use our brands. If not, you'll, you'll hopefully have an opportunity after this uh, to go out and, and give them a try. 
but our products are used by 25% um, of the world's population, right? So the likelihood is you've probably used one or more uh, of our products. Um, we have a strong legacy of innovation. So we've created five of the eight major product categories in which we compete. And we do sell our products uh, globally, right? Into 175 countries. And in 80 of those countries, we hold the number one or number two uh, market share position. If you go to the next one, I just want to give a little bit of a, a background on Global Nonwovens, right? So Global Nonwovens is actually a division within Kimberly-Clark. As Jennifer mentioned, we do uh, have a, a, the goal of producing advantage materials to grow our KC brand. And we do that by delivering both cost and performance benefit. It's not enough to just do one, you have to do both. Um, we are the largest supplier of nonwovens materials in North America and the third largest globally. And we have a long heritage of innovation. Uh, we have a broad patent estate that spans multiple technology platforms. And if you go to the next one, you can kind of get a flavor of what that looks like. Uh, so Global Nonwovens has been in operations for 50 years, um, delivering material innovations that have created quite a few new growth categories for Casey. I haven't highlighted them all here, but I've just highlighted those that I think you guys might be familiar with. So pull-ups is a great one. Um, where the material that we make for the side panels has actually created that category and has created a, a whole new um, potty training experience for moms and dads around the globe. Um, we've done a lot in the healthcare business. We actually used to have an entire business focused in that area. Now we do continue to sell um, personal protective equipment, which I will talk about in a little bit. So there are some different materials that we've invented over the course of time that have grown categories uh, in that space, as well as a uh, house wrap, right? So I don't know if you guys are familiar with blockets. Um, but it is an alternative to Tyvek and it is used to wrap houses and to protect them from the elements. And then the car there at the bottom, which probably is one that people are scratching their head on, but car covers, are, that was a, a category that, that uh, we got into and, and helped to create as well. And so if you go to the next one, uh, I'll, I'll pivot now and kind of say, so now that you have a little bit of a background on who we are, Kimberly Clark and Global Nonwoven specifically, I wanna take you back to, to March of 2020. And I'm sure that most everybody can remember generally what was happening in their lives at the time. And you would turn on the news and you would hear things about COVID and it seemed a world away. It was happening in China. It's never gonna to come to America. And then of course it did, as we all know. And uh, the world turned upside down in a lot of ways. And the pictures here are very representative of what you would see when you turned on the news, right? So it was all around PPE. We don't have enough of it right, particularly face masks, right? And I would actually say, as it says here, there was a crisis uh, of face masks and, and not enough to go around to protect our healthcare workers on the front line. And so if you go to the next one, um, I, you know, I thought it was quite fun to see because uh, this is an area where uh, Global Nonwovens has a, a lot of expertise is that the Financial Times in May of 2020 uh, put the quote out there that said, forget gold, copper, silver, and steel. The hottest commodity of the coronavirus crisis is a little known synthetic fabric called melt blown. And if you go to the next one, you'll see that that's kind of a cool, like blown up version of what melt blown looks like. But you're probably asking, well, why does melt blown matter, right? What, what does it have to do with all this COVID uh, response? Well, it's actually a critical material, as I'm sure a lot of you do know, that's used in the manufacture of N95 face masks. It actually serves as the filtration media that protects you from the virus itself. And during the pandemic, and, and I think you know we're in a better position now, but when things first started going down, a lot of our supply for melt blown and for the appropriate PPE actually was coming from outside of the US. And um, China was, of course, at the time saying, you can't have our supply, we've got to protect our own people. And so it really put um, us in a unique situation where we didn't have enough of that filtration media to make enough face masks to protect our healthcare workers on the front line, as well as other frontline workers, right? Even in, in other industries outside of healthcare. Um, so that has, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, news stories there around expanding capacity. You know, the non-wovens was a real focal point at the time for how do we respond effectively to this COVID-19 crisis and protect our people on our shores. And so if you go to the next one, uh, there's a story tell that, that uh, unfolded here at Kimberly Clark that, uh, you know, we're really proud to share. And, and that is that, um, you know, within Global Nonwovens, we, we have business partners uh, throughout Kimberly Clark, one of whom is our Kimberly Clark professional business. And um, they actually already were selling personal protective equipment, right? So they already make apparel to make face masks for certain parts of uh, 
of the, the market. Um, and we said, you know what? Um, while we haven't made it in a while, we do actually have the ability to make filtration media for um, N95 face masks, right? That would actually meet the need. We, we don't have the ability to convert it and make our own face mask necessarily, but let's find somebody that we can partner with who's already in that space, who already has that capability and see if they're looking for filtration media, which of course at that time they absolutely were. And so over the course of three days, we made connections with various people in the industry. We turned around one of our assets um, in a very short time frame to be able to make this um, material to the specification required of our partner. And in that time frame, we were able to make enough filtration media to produce 17.5 million face masks that went directly to healthcare workers on the front line that were in need at the time. So that was the first really big milestone. And then we said, you know what, we have another challenge in front of us, just like so many other companies at the time. And that is that we need to protect our own people. As I mentioned earlier, we make a lot of different products, including toilet paper, which obviously at the time was in hot demand. And we said, we, we've got to continue to supply these essential products to our consumers. They need us and we need to be there for them. So how do we protect our people so that they can continue to do that super critical work? And so we said, hey, we've got this really unique uh, capability. We've been innovating in this particular space for 25 plus years, I would say serial innovation. Um, we can do things that other people can't do. We can, we can give better performance, better cost. And why don't we use that to protect our own people? And so we actually went out and we partnered with somebody who already had the ability to take that filtration media and convert it into face masks. And we started there, right? And in a very short four week time frame, we had actually created a face mask that we were distributing for our own people inside of Kimberly Clark to protect our people. Then we said, you know what? Um, we, we can do even more than that, right? Like we have a really unique opportunity here, again, because on our personal care side of our business, we have a lot of converting capability, right? So we make diapers at a crazy rate. Um, it's actually quite impressive to see if you guys have never seen it. And so we took some of that expertise and we said, we actually could um, buy our own equipment and set up our own converting lines internally. And we can take the combination of this state-of-the-art proprietary meltwell material that we have amongst other materials. And we can combine that with um, the converting capability. And we can not only make face masks to protect our own people ongoing, but we can also distribute that for external sale uh, to help our partners in Kimberly Clark Professional to grow their business and to enter into a new category, which is really what we exist to, to do and, and to enable. And so we were able to do that in a, in a six weeks time frame, which again, uh, keeping in mind that there's a lot of regulatory work and quality work that's happening in the background, that was very much fast track, right? Because at the time, um, you know, these are things that have frankly never been done before. They would typically take um, many, many uh, weeks longer, probably three or four times that long, um, given the guidelines in place. Um, but we were able to, to work with a variety of people and, and, and work with um, the regulatory bodies to accelerate that process. So very exciting to be able to, to meet the need in such a short time frame. And then the longer term play there, which is in progress and has been um, recently uh, communicated, is we're expanding some of that non-woven capability um, and expanding into some other areas so that we can grow not only for our KCP partners, but also so for our personal care partners, continuing, as I said, to bring that proprietary non-woven technology to bear uh, to grow our personal care brands as well as our B2B brands. So fueling that, that business growth. And if you go to the next, uh, the next one, um, so, so kind of what, what's next and what do we learn in all of this, right? And if you, if you think about the, the theme of this whole um, event, it really is around material innovation and, and um, how do you leverage material innovation to to drive growth and to meet um, emerging consumer needs. Well, we would say, and, and I don't know, again, I, I can't see you guys, so I'm just gonna visualize you that um, by show of hands, maybe you can just do it you know, with me. If you've ever used a, what we call a molded mask, right? Um, this, this one happens to be a, a 3M, right? It's a pretty standard product. Um, it, it's pretty rigid. It's got, uh, you know, elastic that goes around the, the head. Sometimes you'll have uh, those masks that go around the, the ear, right? You'll have an elastic band. 
I don't know about you guys, but I've been wearing masks quite a lot lately, as I'm sure you have been as well. And it can actually be quite uncomfortable, right? So particularly these, these elastic um, bands can cut into the skin. Um, if you look at this metal piece right here, um, that typically goes around the nose. And you know, particularly if you're wearing it for long periods of time, like a full shift, it can create bruising. I'm sure that you guys have probably seen pictures in various publications of, of that effect. And uh, it, it really is an opportunity where material innovation can be leveraged to drive better comfort. And so to, to, to me, that, that really is the next frontier and, and an area uh, that I want to talk about just a little bit more if you go to the next one. And that is, uh, you know, what do consumers even say about using these products, right? Um, so th these are actually quotes from people who are using these for extended period of time, right? They're saying, when I have the mask on, I feel like I'm wearing a dirty diaper. Like, who wants to feel like that, right? Like, that, that doesn't really <laughs> conjure up feelings of, of warm and fuzzy. It's suffocating me, right? I feel so hot. It's making me feel claustrophobic. And frankly, the most pleasant thing about wearing this thing is when the second I get to take it off, right? Um, you know, literally, it's like somebody putting a towel over my face. I can't breathe. That eight-hour day, which frankly... It's already pretty challenging, particularly in this environment with, with all the challenges related to COVID. That eight hour day now feels like 15 hours, right? So it's really, really just grueling. And so one of the things that I wanted to highlight is um, in, in an area where Global Nonwovens has really um, you know, brought a lot of, of their expertise to the table in this category is you know, how do you make the material lighter, right? Like how do you design it differently so that you create more space for the user to breathe so they don't feel like they're suffocating, right? Um, so so we, we've done that uh, with a, a slightly different design. It's called a duckbill design. So it has a, a larger chamber um, that, that allows the consumer to breathe a little bit easier. But the other piece that, that's tied to the material is like the weight of the materials that you use, right? So if you think about when, when we talk about melt blown, the better filtration efficiency you can get at the lower weight which is the innovation that, that GNW brings to the table, um, it actually creates a much better wear experience, right? So you can just imagine lighter weight, I don't have as much you know, preventing me from being able to draw a breath easily. Um, but at the same time, I can feel confident that I'm getting that protection that I need um, to prevent myself from getting COVID or any other kind of nasty, right? Which is really what that, that N95 level protection gets you. So that, that's what, what we bring to the table is kind of a unique way of processing the material that does allow us to get to those you know, lower, lower weights um, so that we can deliver that more comfortable wear experience. And then the other piece that you know, I was mentioning earlier is, is on this molded mask and kind of the more traditional view that you would see in the market is that really tight elastic, right? Which not only creates some challenges behind the ear in terms of you know digging into the skin, but it really does create kind of a feeling of fatigue when, when wearing over the course of a long period of time. Um, so we also have within Global Nonwovens a unique material, an elastic-based material, it's film-based, um, that we put in as our head straps, right? And so they're really stretchy and they distribute the tension much more readily across a wider area than what these really thin elastic straps do. And so I've actually been wearing them around quite a lot in the last week or so. And uh, you, know, you can, for me personally, I can wear it all day and I, I really don't get that same indentation behind my ear that I get when I wear the, the uh, competing product. And so these are all areas where, you know, material innovation can be leveraged to drive that consumer benefit. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, that's what we consider ourselves, that, that's our mission, right, is, is to really bring those unique material innovations to life in different product forms, right? So it's a combination of the material innovation, the material properties, but also the way that you put all the pieces together, which is the product design. So it's really a combination of those two things. And our hope is that by bringing all of these pieces together, we can create a completely different experience for the consumer so that those narratives that you see up on the screen change to something positive. Now, can I say that somebody is ever gonna say, please let me wear a face mask all day long? I don't know, but that would be a win in our book, right? Um, but at a minimum, we would like them to not you know, feel like they're suffocating, right? We'd like them to feel as though they can draw that breath easily 
they can do the work that they need to do. They can focus on things and not worry so much about the protection that's on their face, knowing that it's going to do what it needs to do and it's going to allow them to continue to, to focus on their day to day. Um, and that is actually like all that I had formally prepared. I am a very, um, you know, I, I, I like chatty person. So if, if you guys have questions, please um, feel free to, to ask questions. I really wanted to allow this uh, time at the end to really be kind of open dialogue, uh, questions around approach and things like that, uh, that you might have for me. Thanks very much, Lori. Now that's great. Um, I certainly want to open it up to the room for discussion. Um, if anyone has a question for Lori, please uh, feel free to just turn your video on so that we can see you, um, or you can raise your hand as well, um, or you can enter a question to the chat box. So anyone who has a question, feel free to, to do that now. And I know Lori will be uh, in the breakout sessions a little later, so maybe with a, a smaller group. I see one question coming through chat, Lori, is are the yeah. KC masks available now and how long did they take to develop to market and where can they be purchased? Yeah, that's a really great question. I was, I didn't want to give, make a plug, but I'll make a plug since you asked. Uh, <laughs> so they, they are actually available on Amazon. Uh, you can just type in Kimberly Clark in 95 and, and they'll, they'll pop up for you. Um, in terms of time to market, that's really, I think, what makes this story so um, unique is that, you know, we were able over the course of a six week period, really, um, to bring these from, you know, an idea to reality, you know, fully packaged and, and, and ready to be distributed. Um, like I said, the, the first pass was really how do we protect our frontline healthcare workers through people who are kind of already established in this space. Then we kind of focus on how do we protect our own frontline workers, um, and and now that has progressed into a, a full business, right? And, and you'll see when you when you pop onto Amazon, it can be purchased in multiple locations. That's uh, certainly the one that uh, most people will will lean towards since it delivers right to your door. But oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Lori? Again, feel free to enter it in the chat button or raise your hand or just turn your video on. I guess, Lori, while we're waiting, you mentioned kind of partnerships earlier. Obviously, we have a lot of stakeholders from different UW campuses here and, and other, other partners. Um, you know, how often do you collaborate with, with universities? And, and, you know, is there any opportunity there? I'm sure, I'm sure our yes. faculty- Yes, that's actually a really great question. And, and, um, and I appreciate you asking it, Jennifer, because I didn't go into a lot of the detail, but I will say that at the beginning of, of the, the COVID response and kind of the March timeframe, I was actually lucky enough to have the opportunity to lead the, the Kimberly Clark in Global Nonwoven's kind of COVID response. So I, at the time, was taking a lot of calls from both industry and universities. Um, University of Wisconsin was actually one that we were collaborating with a fair bit for a period of time. So we, we collaborate very readily um, with a variety of universities, um, particularly in the Midwest. We've got a lot of Great, great luck with uh, with you guys. Um, and, and of course, we have our, our headquarters there in, in Nina, so so very close to home. Um, so that is certainly something we're always open to, to those conversations. Um, some of the best and brightest come out of university, obviously. Uh, so we're always looking for for that influx of ideas and uh, and and different ways of thinking, which which we do see quite readily from the university space. Um, so it really was pretty amazing for me personally. Um, to see the outpouring of people at the time that all of this happened for, for really a, a few month period there, just all hands on deck, everybody wanted to help and everybody brought a unique um, kind of perspective to the table and a unique skill set, which was cool to see. That's great. Um, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, one other question that came through on the chat is, are all commercially available N95 masks made using melt blown filtration media? And are there any drawbacks to melt blown? And is there research into alternatives? Yeah, that, that's a great question too. So um, the answer, the short answer is is no, right? There's, there's, there's a variety of materials that can be used for that filtration media. I would say that melt blown is typically the, the choice uh, of many um, in large part because of the cost position, right? And the fact that um, you can get that particle filtration efficiency at relatively low weights, so you don't have this big unwieldy mask. Um, but there are a variety of um, alternative technologies that are in play actually currently in the market. 
um, but also as a result of that COVID response that I was mentioning earlier, um, there were there were folks coming from a lot of different areas, um, you know, bringing forward different filtration media uh, that was used in different applications and saying, hey, how might we be able to to use this and put it into a mask? So so certainly that is an area that's kind of prime um, for innovation. Again, I, I would still say that that milk blown has a lot of benefits in terms of, you know, the ease of treating it um, and, and doing so at a, at a cost position that, that makes sense for a disposable type product like this. Mm, thank you. And I think we have time for just one more question that came through on chat. It's, are there concerns of inferior materials making it onto the market in the global supply chain, especially during high, command, high demand? And how do you combat this? Yeah, that, that's actually a really great question as well. I would say, um, again, at the beginning stages of this, where we, we, we were kind of still setting up a supply chain and a lot of that melt blown material that we would have previously gotten, um, not Kimberly Clark per se, but really just the US market would have come from China. And there was a lot of capacity expansion that was happening. Our assumption and a lot of our research would say that, that some of those materials are, are not as good quality, right? So do they get into the US market? I, I, I would assume so, right? I, I don't have any in front of me right now, but uh, how, do you, how do you control that? To me, it's really with the right protocols in place from a purchasing perspective, right? Being sure that you have the right documentation when you do purchase a product online, because that's probably the biggest risk is if you go, let's say onto an Amazon or some other um, platform that maybe isn't as well established, you know, they might say the right things, but, that, but do they have the right documentation along with it that says it's properly certified for that in 95 um, particle filtration efficiency, because that, that really is typically what you want to look for. Depends on the application. Sometimes you might need, not need that level of protection, but for a lot of the applications we're talking about, that really is the critical piece that you want to look for, and you want to be sure that that's certified by NIOSH. Um, and if you don't have a NIOSH certification, then I would probably you know start to question the, the validity of that source. Well, thank you so much, Lori. I, again, really appreciate your time today. Appreciate the presentation and look forward to further discussion in the breakout room. Uh, so thanks again, a virtual round of applause <laughs> for Lori. <laughs> thank so you thanks guys, Lori. Yeah. Appreciate so, your time. Thank you. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Tony Hansen, who will uh, take on the next session. Tony. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you again, Lori. We, we really do appreciate you being here to share insights into Kimberly Clark's journey throughout the pandemic. So next up, we are pleased to have a series of short presentations by Wisconsin companies and UW researchers, which further highlight the importance of material science and manufacturing and how those in these fields have risen to the challenge in response to the coronavirus pandemic. So I'd like to start off by taking this opportunity to introduce Aaron Hagar, Vice President for the Division of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. So Aaron and his team led the WEDC's We're All Innovating competition, and we are delighted to have two of the competition's winners here with us today. So I'd like to invite Aaron um, to say a few words about the competition and introduce these two speakers. Great, thanks, Tony. Uh, really glad to be here to talk about this. Um, it's amazing, you know, you, you start a project like this and, and you just don't know how long it's gonna go, but this is actually my second presentation today on, on the innovation contest. So um, it started uh, um, back in the summer and into fall when we were trying to think about ways that we could leverage the creativity of Wisconsin small businesses to respond to uh, the challenges of the pandemic. And we quickly realized that innovation was not going to be just what uh, the folks on, on, um, at this conference think about, uh, you know, the typical um, high tech, uh, you know, coming out of a university advanced um, uh, technology kind of innovation, but it was also going to be business models and applications. So we, we devised a contest um, that tried to reach everything. So it really uh, spanned the, the entire spectrum of of business opportunities, we didn't want to leave anybody outside the eligibility window. So it broke down into three sections. Um, one was focusing on the health impacts of, of COVID. One was focusing on technology solutions to address the, the challenges of, of COVID. Um, and then one was business models. And that would allow us to get to 
uh, support for obviously the health impacts, but also what sort of materials or software technologies are, are supporting businesses and communities. And then the business model is how do we support those, those more Main Street style businesses or service businesses that are, are trying to help their communities and customers respond to the, the uh, more day-to-day -day, uh, implications of COVID. So we ran that contest in partnership with the Wisconsin Technology Council because of their experience running the Governor's Business Plan Contest. We were able to leverage their experience uh, and expertise. And uh, we really didn't know what we were gonna get. So we put it out there, nobody had ever done this before. And we thought we'd probably have a couple hundred applications. So we had 1200 applications. Um, and when you're planning for a couple hundred, that means you've, you've uh, got to scramble. And we were able to pull in um, uh, 186 judges to help us get that work done, volunteers from across the state. Some of you may, uh, of, of the attendees here may have been judges. Um, so really wanna uh, thank anybody who lent a hand in, in helping us get this done. And at the end of the day, we were able to support 226 companies, um, all small businesses between zero and five employees, um, or zero and 50 employees, I'm sorry, um, that are doing something to help us all respond to COVID. So uh, with that as backdrop, uh, I want to introduce two speakers. Um, Bruce Winkler from Innovation Strategy will tell us a little bit about uh, the, the equipment that, that he has helped to develop that uh, addresses some of the sterilization challenges of equipment. Uh, and then Dr. James Hamilton will talk about uh, his, uh, his approach using polymers for, for novel hand sanitizers. So with that, I will hand it back to Tony to, to handle logistics. <laughs> Great. So... Take it away, Bruce. All right, very good. You can hear me okay? We can, yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go through some slides fairly quickly. I guess we only have eight to 10 minutes uh, per person here. So uh, 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 anyway, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what we developed, which was a, um, a UVC sterilizer for um, um, re-sterilizing uh, PPE equipment and other types of uh, small disposables and um, products in hospitals, uh, uh, emergency facilities, and um, uh, EMTs. So uh, next. So uh, because I'm not a Kimberly Clark, I'll just let you know that I've been doing innovation and new product development for the last 30 years, uh, a fair amount in uh, uh, biomedical instrumentation and prenatal diagnostics. We do, uh, we've done everything from uh, uh, the Human Genome Project to uh, portable x-ray machines and uh, 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 and the UW has been both one of my biggest clients over the years and also one of my biggest suppliers of, uh, of, of technology, of consulting, and uh, every semester, uh, two to three interns that we bring in from engineering to work on uh, fun projects and, uh, uh, and um, uh, you know, specifically client engineering projects and, and trying to learn a little more about uh, the engineering process. Um, so I'm going to take just about 30 seconds just, just to go through uh, just one quick um, uh, product development element that I think is most important in development uh, next. And that has to do with um, uh, just the product development process. And that uh, what I found over 30 years is that we're wonderful at identifying problems and formulating problems, but uh, it, it, we're, we're, um, we're growing the opportunity now to be able to develop the best concepts for solving problems like you see with a lot of the big companies today. Uh, they're reaching further and further out into the digital world to uh, 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 find resources for solving. And um, uh, frankly, you know, we're very good again at, then in evaluating and implementing problems, but it's the developing, developing of the concepts to actually solve the problem that, uh, uh, that we're working on making um, uh, stronger today. Next. So uh, uh, what I like to see and what we try to do for, for um, uh, on our projects, both uh, uh, whether it's state, federal, or uh, private industry is uh, bring, pro bring clients the best um, uh, set of concepts to uh, uh, solve the problem and then work to implement that. And uh, this all works through collaborative, uh, collaborative development. And um, we have found the collaborative development model to be the best because you bring in resources on a virtual basis to get in and get out of a project and uh, uh, on a what by when basis for how much. And uh, it works out uh, quite, quite well. Next. Uh, this slide just speaks to that, and it has to do with uh, the group you bring in to solve a, solve a set of problems. Um, you know, there's all that is knowable within your head as the innovator, um, but you you try to solve solve problems um, with more like all that is knowable within your group. 
uh, even better, all that is knowable within your company, uh, even better, all that is knowable within your industry. And finally, uh, if you can be so bold as to say, all that is knowable. So um, we try using uh, uh, the newest networking tools and um, uh, 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 <coughs> access to broad sets of resources to, uh, to, you know, to reach out when we're trying to solve problems. So, um, so uh, you know, collaboration today is, is, you know, is resource management, global sourcing and intellectual property, they're all pivotal. So, um, so with this said, the topic of this short talk is, is to share with you uh, the, 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 gorilla, the gorilla development we went through on the UVC conveyor sterilizer and how we use a collaborative model to execute. Next. <laughs> so um, we had like 10 years of experience developing UVC products, UVC products to start with, which is really a great advantage because uh, UVC like light and optics are like black science to engineering. It's like, uh, uh, or black magic, what I was trying to say is uh, uh, they're very hard to understand and you really need to know it. And we've learned over 10 years uh, all about uh, um, uh, the UVC uh, resources and um, uh, safety, evolution, design, development, specifications, supply chain, and uh, also in efficacy and regulatory. Uh, this particular product, as example, was a Roomba vacuum that we outfitted as a uh, uh, as a UVC robot for cleaning floors in schools, food facilities, hospitals, and uh, childcare. And we basically ripped out all the elements of the uh, of the robot, uh, the uh, the brushes, the blowers, the motors, um, and uh, we replaced it with a UVC ray and used the onboard um, navigation and sensors to actually go around and sterilize a room. Again, not reinventing the wheel here, but uh, um, uh, taking the robot that already did all those things and making it productive. Next, uh, a, a, a new product that we've just completed over the last two years was a UVC broom, basically uh, the size of a push broom that develops a, um, um, a very high intensity UVC um, irradiation to, uh, to the floor and uh, allows you to push it at a certain rate to sterilize the ground. Uh, the picture happens to show you um, uh, how, it's, how it was being used last week at the Iowa State Wrestling Tournament where um, uh, uh, 12 people at a time would, 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 would sweep the floor um, to sterilize it for germs and viruses. And, uh, um, uh, tended to work extremely well. Next. So over the last many years, we developed a real uh, understanding of the UVC technology. And our goal when the pandemic hit was to say, hey, we really understand UVC in terms of um, sterilization and product development. And uh, we wanna see what can we develop that would be valuable. And we went to, uh, uh, started looking at the consortium that was building at UW in the health and medical um, facilities and they were looking for and starting to talk to outside resources, students, professors, companies and individuals and consultants to help um, with supply chain, um, uh, help evaluate technology, um, things that had to do with safety and, and supply chain. And um, uh, we look to be part of that. Next. Next, please. So, um, uh, uh, so the, the the UW medical uh, uh, community quickly got overwhelmed and they asked UW Engineering, can you guys please help us develop a protocol by which we can take all these great ideas people are offering and put them into a methodology to actually actually yield a result that would be, that would be usable. Of course, in the medical community, uh, 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 like several others, safety, efficacy, and validation are really important elements to the, to the product development process. So. Um, we wanted to sort of skip to the head of the line on this because we brought a lot of development process, development uh, methodology and, and understanding and the ability as a small company to do rapid prototyping. Next. So our objective was simply to tweak the wheel, not to uh, reinvent the wheel, but uh, uh, to look at how could we use our UVC um, capabilities um, and create something that had value. And a lot of companies and people were looking to do the same thing. They were looking to donate their services. They were looking to uh, just to contribute in, in, in one way, any way, shape and form they could to help early on and even, you know, of course, till today with the pandemic. And um, our goals were exactly the same. Next. So we reached out to a, a, a number of companies, the first one being Clark and Associates that made a, a beautiful commercial toaster you guys have probably all seen in hotels where you put the bagel on the conveyor and it goes down the conveyor, toast, and then comes out the bottom. Uh, they, they were pretty uh, miffed at, uh, 
our, our interest in using their toaster to turn it into a sterilizer, but they were pretty delighted at the same time. Um, and it helps that our interest was purely philanthropic. So we weren't getting into this to make money or to turn it into a, uh, a final product that we could sell. We simply also, like most of the other companies that got involved, wanted to simply uh, contribute to the uh, um, to, to solutions for the problem. We worked with a BOLB that we, that uh, was willing to uh, uh, donate UVC supply LEDs and bulbs to help us help us accomplish the goal. We worked with uh, WL Gore that were the experts in reflective materials for UVC. Um, part of this consortium through the university, we met ETC online. They were part of this, and they were also looking to find out how could they contribute, what could they what could they make with their lighting capabilities and manufacturing? Uh, they didn't have any UVC products, but they were, they were quickly learning how to uh, integrate UVC into their fixtures. Um, uh, the Badri in Madison was willing to give us space to actually manufacture and weld and assemble. Uh, UW Engineering, uh, several professors were willing to help us with some of the mechanics. And lastly, uh, the state, the Wisconsin State Hygiene Lab came on line at the end to help us with testing and protocols. Uh, next. So we'll go quick, uh, quickly through this. We started with a basic toaster. This, here's the, here's the, uh, the toaster oven out of the gate. Well, like we told the company, we said, hey, we're gonna take your toaster oven and we're gonna rip out the, um, uh, the heating elements. We're gonna replace them with UVC, uh, specialized UVC bulbs that we had had custom made with custom ballast. Um, and that we knew uh, because of our background what the power was, uh, we knew the speed, we, we could calculate the efficacy and we were gonna turn this into a, uh, a UVC conveyor. Next. Um, from here, we got into fabrication, uh, ripped it apart. Um, we had uh, um, uh, UVC bulb testing. Uh, we welded up certain components. We fabricated certain components, and and actually, you know, within a day in the shop, turned it into a uh, a fully working, uh, uh, a reliable product. Next, from there, we went to testing to make sure we could actually put masks through it. You may recall early on that the issue was we don't have enough masks. We need to um, uh, we need to reuse masks and we need to make sure that they're safe. And so we donned the uh, uh, PPE. We looked to make sure that the things went down the conveyor, that they could be used with people in full garb and uh, found that things worked uh, quite well. From here, next, uh, uh, ETC said, yeah, sure, we'll work with you. Um, I'll tell you what, Bruce, we'll... Um, uh, we have the facilities, we have the manpower, we're, uh, we're down to a skeleton crew, we'll bring people in, we'll manufacture the first 25 units, we'll see how it goes, and uh, uh, you can count on us to build it, and we're not going to charge anything, you're not going to charge anything, we'll just keep this, uh, this train going. And um, uh, they were kind enough to uh, give us some great engineering and their facilities, and um, uh, uh, they actually uh, started to take our initial prototype and build materials and specifications and turn it into a manufacturable product. Next. Uh, here you are looking at actually the short run of products that was being set up and built to, uh, 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 to, to be able to make a product that could be distributed. Next. And the product actually became a, uh, um, you know, a fully specified product with uh, collateral materials product sheets, uh, safety, safety precautions, a user manual, and uh, all the aspects of doing a product release, um, and all of this happening in four weeks. Next. Uh, the other key components that uh, we got very lucky on well had has to do with product valid validation. One of the biggest products that you have with products in health and uh, medicine is you need the validation. You need to know that the product works. Uh, people get very nervous around things like UVC light, uh, especially when you throw around the term uh, radiation and how much uh, radiation the, LED, the LEDs are putting out or the mercury vapor lamps are putting out and how do we know it's safe and how do we know it cleans because we can't see it clean and we can't see if the germs are removed. So we have to know that it works. Well, the state of Wisconsin happened to be looking for a conveyor system. They didn't know it at the time when the UW did its first product release on this. And, um, uh, the, and the, the state came in and said, hey, um, we'd like to be your first customer and buy 15 of these. Um, uh, we'll develop the, uh, uh, we'll, we'll come over and validate your product. They came over in full garb with, with sensors and systems for, for, for being certain that we were delivering enough radiation to actually sterilize the, uh, uh, the masks and uh, blood, blood pressure cuffs. Um, uh, here they actually developed the, uh, the protocols and methodology and developed videos for people to be able to uh, see exactly how to use it. And from here, the next steps were pretty clear. 
the next thing I knew I was out on the street, which was uh, probably the most fun for me going to firehouses and EMTs, uh, going to police stations and uh, schools and de dental offices, delivering the product and actually setting it up and um, showing them how to use it. Next. Uh, we were in dental offices. We, we put them into uh, uh, medical facilities and we knew that they were gonna actually perform like they were uh, uh, expected because we had all the validation behind it. Next. Uh, several other opportunities continue to come from this. Uh, these pictures just kind of show you some of the some of the products we've been working on. One being a full full suit decontamination for hospitals. We were asked to, to develop a light source that could uh, 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 keep keep touch screens clean in medical centers. Uh, the last two products are kind of fun. Uh, some of our clients in Las Vegas came to us and said, "Can you can you add UVC lights to our uh, card sorter you know <laughs> card shufflers?" Um, uh, uh, in our casinos. Next. Through the grant on this project, um, we've been developing the next, the next generation product, which instead of using mercury vapor lamps, uses uh, very high power UVC LEDs, which we've been researching for two years uh, before the pandemic. And we now have a system fully developed and designed that actually uh, uh, produces six times the radiation and sterilization capabilities of the first model that we did with ETC. And that's where that's at today. I hope uh, next. Uh, hope this was uh, entertaining and uh, informative. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I think we have time for just one question. So if anyone wants to either turn on the camera or enter that into the chat, we can um, have one question here for Bruce. Did I go over my eight minutes? I guess I did. Huh? A little bit. <laughs> Um, otherwise, I can ask a question and other questions can be saved for the breakout rooms. I was curious what the exposure time um, is in order to adequately disinfect the PPE or other items. Well, the, the exposure time has everything to do with the conveyor system. It has to do with how fast the conveyor is going. So uh, because the lamps only had one power, which is fully on, we actually had to go through and adjust the, uh, the conveyor system to make sure it was moving slow enough. Uh, to give us the appropriate uh, exposure and radiation and sterilization. So uh, uh, we were pushing through about um, uh, 30 masks a minute um, on the conveyor system. Um, our, our newest conveyors uh, with the WEDC grants will uh, do twice that speed. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Bruce. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you. And next up, then, we have Dr. Jim Hamilton. Hello, everybody. Take it away whenever you're ready, Jim. Oh, oh, OK, great. So hi. Um, so this uh, brief presentation is just going to provide an introduction to the story of how we responded in the COVID pandemic. Um, out of the blue, at the end of February 2020, we were asked to manufacture alcohol-based sanitizer solutions due to the shortage across the country. And I looked into what was involved and decided we could do it. And we ended up shipping over 120 55-gallon drums and 300, uh, 30,000 bottles around the country, 80% within Wisconsin. We also developed our own gel-based formulation we called HansoSoft that is very popular and we're going to continue making it even past COVID and try and head into commodity markets like grocery stores. Um, the ladies at the quilt shop say that our new gel formulation leaves their hands as smooth as a baby's bum. That wasn't a very good name though, so it's HansoSoft. The World Health Organization's um, re recommended recipe consists of um, either isopropyl alcohol or ethyl alcohol, purified water, and glycerin. And that was our base that we started with. And if I've learned anything from this experience, it's about the importance of logistics and logistics and logistics, because that was really, really trouble. Um, and before we discuss a little more, a little background on our company seems appropriate. Next slide. 
So we've been rewarded with uh, nearly a million dollars in funding from NASA. And so you may wonder what's all this about. Um, it's about the future of space telescopes, about exoplanets, deep ultraviolet mirrors, and planetary protection technology needs. And we've all become used to the beautiful images of planets and nebulas and galaxies. And um, the, the, uh, we imagine beautiful pristine mirrors like the one in the upper left-hand corner, which is a James Webb telescope mirror. But really, um, reality is quite different. In operation, mirrors get dirty within weeks and can't be cleaned or touched because they scratch and delaminate. At night, dust falls on surfaces. Even Hubble launched with 10% reduced reflectivity because it sat and collected dust first. And less light means less science, more downtime, and more expense. Next slide, please. So in Platteville, we originally developed a liquid polymer solution with solvents that's for optics, lasers, and telescopes that's applied, dried, and peeled, safely removing contaminants from uncleanable surfaces. Next slide, please. So, well, it turns to capture light from exoplanets around distant stars, NASA plans on using sunflower-shaped spacecraft that suppress starlight by a factor of a billion, but allow exoplanet light by. The starshade flies in formation 50,000 kilometers away from a Hubble-like telescope. In our current grants um, with NASA, we developed a polymer coating for the petal edges, and um, because even a few specks of dust will, um, in the half mile long perimeter of the starshade, will reflect more, scatter more light back than uh, the exoplanet will send. So that's what we're working on. And um, next slide, please. So um, th this slide tells us about some of the complications that we ran into in scaling up and about it. It's just some things that I wanted to mention as we go. First of all, so um, the state uh, sent us said they were gonna send POs and there were no bottles to be had. And so, um, you know, they say they're gonna do this and there's no bottles to be had and we had to grab them when we got them. And so we took a big risk and we went $30,000 in debt in bottles while we didn't have a purchase order from the state because they're the state and they took a little while to get rolling. So there's a big risk involved in these kind of pandemic responses. Um, the chemicals weren't available. The federal government grabbed all isopropyl alcohol, all of it, and you couldn't have it. And no, they weren't even using it, they were holding it. And so fortunately we went, just got some ethanol, but it was a really big deal. And we only got it because we were already a supply, already a buyer from the, of alcohol for our products. Otherwise we couldn't have got, we couldn't get it. That's a typo there, it's, it's uh, USP uh, chemicals there. We, we had to develop also labels and barcodes and, uh, and get into the uh, grocery store system and things. And, and that was challenging in and of itself fast. And, 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 and then we trademarked Hand So Soft because we could. And it turns out that Avon who makes Skin So Soft is now contesting that. And so we can't use that. So trademarks and other things are a real issue. And we have to, um, there was an allowance to, um, with FDA and EPA to um, get, um, to manufacture these things, which are considered drugs. And, um, but we had to then deal with that. And uh, a kind of funny story is that I sent uh, a sample to my friend, longtime friend who works at the EPA and we had put on the label surface and if you take a sanitizer and you have a word, the word surface anywhere in the label, it means it's a pesticide and you have to get regulation from the EPA and you have to get certified. And so we had to start certification for that because I sent some to my friend, which is kind of funny, but that's the case. Well, and then we just took surface off all the labels and we were okay, but that's funny. Um, so then there was also issues with, you know, scale up that I'll talk about a little later. And um, so um, next slide, please. Um, so the, uh, the 
the timeline of all of this is I was actually on a speaking tour in, in France and Israel um, in end of February and March 10th, the United States shut down all flights and I got home like March 7th and I had to change flights twice. I was in France and I was supposed to spend the weekend in Lake Cuomo, Italy before I went to Israel. And it was the center of the COVID epidemic right then. And I just had a bad feeling. And so I changed my flight to go to Barcelona to Israel. And then when I was in Israel, I actually had to change my flights and, and I went through Athens and London to get home. And I got home just as the state had emailed. And so the, the health, Department of Health Services. And um, so the, uh, I'm gonna open up a, uh, another slide here, so I see. And so the, the timeline there was then we started figuring out manufacturing and there was apparently nobody could make, nobody could make any of this and we just kept taking more and more. And so we, uh, but we spent all the time, every day, three or four times a day, I called every bottle company in the United States. And somebody had some caps and someone else had some bottles. And uh, so we, we filled a big warehouse. We rented the place next door, hired 12 extra people to work on this and uh, ended up um, producing all of this material. And um, we had to, and talk about going from laboratory to production and to the marketplace. You know, we had to buy drum lifts. We had to deal with um, many 55 gallon drums and, um, and the chemicals were in such short supply that um, we had to really finagle how to get them. And you remember I said that they wouldn't ship chemicals to you if you didn't already buy them. Well, so we could get some ethyl alcohol, but we couldn't get glycerin and we couldn't get these other um, powders, these really wonderful polymers that um, are used in addition to ours to make this hand sanitizer good. And so um, I had to call uh, some people we knew in a nearby town that had already bought some uh, of these things like glycerin and the chemical companies would ship to them. And I took my car in a trailer and I had to go pick up the chemicals in my car because of COVID they wouldn't ship to anybody that wasn't a new customer. So it was just somewhat interesting or anything. And um, so here and here you see uh, loading the pallets. We sent 18 pallets to Madison. We became a dealer for Napa Auto Parts and shipped all over the country from Florida to Alaska to California and Colorado and ship pallets there also. And, um, and uh, you know, it culminated in us winning this uh, We're All Innovating Award from WDC for which we're really grateful for. Um, last slide, um, next one. Um, and, and I just wanna tell you one story that was really pretty interesting. And that is uh, one of the biggest problems we ran into in scaling was we wanted to now mix 55 gallon drums. We, we mixed some smaller drums and for our products and things, but we needed to do a lot of 55 gallon drums. So I went to McMaster car and I bought this nice stirring thing that fits in a drum. Looks great, right? Well, it turns out that they'll sell these things to you, but boy, talk about unforeseen circumstances. You needed a compressor that was uh, so big it would be like for a building and a, com a compressor like that cost almost $15,000. And so this was just a non-starter and we weren't sure how we were gonna be able to mix up this stuff without it. And um, it turns out unrelated to our work with NASA, this little thing in the green barrel there is a little air driven turbine that some little company in uh, Ohio makes. And this will run on the Black Menard's big, mon big uh, compressor that is kind of more normal. And so we were able to use this and now then make our gel instead of having a whole big chemical facility. And we need a whole building with a 10 foot by five foot compressor. But who'd have thought that a compressor was really the limitation in all of that? So that's just some of the things that we went through and there was lots and lots of experimentation and iteration and figuring out how to, how to be a formulator. 
And uh, with the next slide, I'll just thank you and be happy to take any questions or talk to you in the breakout session. Does anyone have any questions for Jim? You can turn on your camera or send it through in the chat. If not, we can just continue moving on. Thank you again, Jim. Sure thing, thanks very much. All right, so then I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Doug Dunham is chair of the Material Science and Biomedical Engineering Department at UW-Eau Claire and director of the Material Science and Engineering Center. Now this center facilitates collaborations between industry and the university in the area of material science and engineering. Today, Dr. Dunham will be speaking on community partnerships responding to COVID-19. Please welcome Dr. Dunham. All right. So this talk basically is about how as a community, we came together uh, to provide uh, PPE for local healthcare workers. So um, originally um, we've had a partnership with Mayo Clinic uh, for a couple years and um, go to the next slide here. So the way this has worked basically is the collaboration with Mayo Health System um, basically has, we have a offsite um, collaboration area uh, that became very helpful for this during this pandemic. We use that ex uh, very um, exclusively for the projects I'm going to discuss here. Uh, we've also had lots of research collaborations with Mayo Clinic, um, in particular in the area of 3D printing. Uh, we were basically offering a course in 3D printing and medicine and uh, some research collaborations in 3D printing with cardiac surgeons. So basically, as the um, pandemic hit, uh, we were starting to look at how to 3D print face masks and uh, face shields. At the same time, um, makers in the community had approached Mayo Clinic to see if there was ways that they could help out. And so basically what happened then was the meeting was set up so that we could see if we could um, focus our efforts. So next slide, please. And so what ended up resulting here really was a very broad-based community effort. And so um, we had the Chippewa Valley Makers, which is uh, basically people in the community that have 3D printers in their garage and their basements. Um, all willing to help with this project. Uh, we had people who sew to make masks, and we had various companies that were um, interested in helping any way they could. And then we had the UW Eau Claire Foundation that could provide some support and a, a way to get money to help support this. With the end result, basically trying to provide PPE for the local healthcare providers, um, first responders, um, lots of nursing homes were in desperate need of PPE, and also optometry clinics and uh, dental clinics. Next slide, please. And so in this group, what we decided was face shields was the way to go. That's the one thing we could all um, work on as a community to provide for the healthcare providers. So we looked at two different designs here. Um, both were approved by NIH. That was one of the things that the local hospitals thought was really important is that they had those approved designs. Uh, so we tried both of these out. We uh, printed off some examples, gave them to um, nurses, um, doctors, at the local hospitals. Uh, we were hoping that we could go with just one model, um, but what happened was is different groups like different ones, they fit differently. So one of them has a little bit larger space between basically the forehead and um, where the, the um, clear plastic is, and the other one is a little bit closer. So everyone had sort of their favorite uh, way they wanted to do that, or what, the, the one that they liked the best. So next slide, please. So the way this whole collaboration for these, um, 3D printed face shields work really was um, the Chippewa Valley makers created a website where any of the healthcare providers could submit requests. Um, that then went to us at this 3D, print, 3D printing center, this off campus site of our collaborative site. And so um, orders would come into us. Uh, we would help gather materials, get them to the makers. Uh, so then when the makers made the, the um, visor part, they would deliver them to the 3D, print, 3D printing center. We also were 3D printing at this 3D printing center. Um, we had local companies providing resources through the foundation and materials into the printing center. We use Slack a lot to communicate, to basically let makers know when we needed more things. If we were running low, makers would let us know that they were running low on um, 
PLA material, things like that. So we could provide that for them. And so this 3D, 3D printing center, this collaborative center really provided the location to center all of this. And so everything was going through that. And then basically they would end up going out to the different uh, healthcare providers. Next slide, please. And so what we did then is um, I had five or six students working during this time. This was basically March through um, August, we did this. Um, the students would basically punch the plastics for the shields, um, assemble the visors, um, package them. They would look at the orders that came in, um, let the healthcare providers that needed them know that they could come pick them up. And so this center became the, distribu the making uh, distribution center um, and the students were vital in making this work. Um, in the end, we ended up making um, 3,000 face shields. Um, about about 1,200 of those were made by UW Eau Claire um, in, our, in our center. The rest were all made by makers in the community. Next slide, please. So that was one of the major things we did in, in response to COVID. Um, another project we did with Mayo Clinic here was uh, uh, the Halyard Mask Project. So um, this Halyard material is material that's used to cover surgical instruments during operations. Um, Mayo had done some studies or had, had access to some studies that showed that this material did a really good job of filtering um, close to N95 level. And so they had purchased um, lots of this material um, and made it available to be made into masks. Uh, to make them into masks though, you, these thing, these, uh, the Halyard material comes in 48 inch by 40 inch sheets. Um, it has to be cut down. And so we had students that would uh, cut down into the right sizes, um, cut them into strips for the, um, for the ties and things like that. And so um, in this project then we made 60 of these kits that each um, had 10. Um, and, and what would happen then is after we made the kits, sewers in the community would come pick up the kits, they'd take them home, they'd sew them, bring them back, um, and then we could distribute them to the hospitals. Uh, the nice thing about the, the key thing, we, reason why we used the halyard material, again, this is when the N95 masks short, was, um, were so short, um, was that this halyard material is autoclavable. So they could be, um, the mask could be used and then autoclaved and then reused again. And so they knew that by doing that, they could save some of the N95 masks. And these were intended mainly for people not doing direct patient care, but other people in the hospital. So that was another of the projects that we did. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the other things we, um, in preparation for this course that we were gonna teach in 3D printing in medicine, um, Dr. Jane Matsumoto from the uh, Rochester Clinic um, was involved in that. She basically was here um, March through uh, June or July too, working with us on all these 3D printing projects. Um, but she had lots of connections at uh, the University of South Florida, and Northwell Health in New York. And so um, there was also the swab shortage. Um, Forum Labs, the maker of uh, the printers shown here in the picture, are the ones that uh, developed a design for these swabs that could be used. And so we started um, participating in the clinical study. So we printed off swabs and then had them tested. Um, Dr. Matsumoto did most did all of the arranging for the, with the Mayo Clinics and things so we could test them both in Rochester and here in Eau Claire. And so if you're familiar with the swabs, um, they're these long, about six inches long with the ends there. These, this, in this case, these are all 3D printed. Um, initial studies have shown basically that uh, these are as effective or maybe even more effective than the traditional uh, more cotton swabs. Next slide, please. So these are what the swabs look like as we print them. Uh, basically, depending on which printer of the formats printers we use, you can either print 320 or um, um, 250 at a time. And so they're printed, they're then cleaned, they uh, um, have to be cleaned in uh, isopropyl alcohol. So again, we had a hard time finding isopropyl alcohol too, just like uh, Jim was saying, we did have a bit of a stockpile headed into this, so we were okay for a while. Um, so they had to be cleaned with the isopropyl alcohol and then had to be UV clean or UV uh, cured. So um, we did, ran these through some um, clinical trials. Uh, one of the things we noticed was depending on the processing, we had a, some that would come out that were a little bit more fragile than we would have expected. And so we were worried about breakage. The last thing you want with one of these swabs is because it's so deep is for it to break off while it's um, in there. Um, so we have 
been doing some studies um, post uh, the SWAB project to try to determine what are the conditions to have the right material characteristics so you have that flexibility and still have it have all the right properties. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last project here, a little bit different. During that first meeting, we were trying to determine um, what we would do as a group. Um, someone at Mayo Clinic had mentioned that um, they were de designing or had access to these uh, design for an intubation box. So um, when a patient is intubated, um, they usually cough and a lot of um, um, air comes out. And so what they were at the point doing surgeries and stuff like that, when they, anytime they had to intubate, what would happen is they'd only allow one person in this, the operating room at the time when they did the intubation, uh, because if someone had COVID, it was going to get in, uh, spread out throughout the room pretty um, readily. Um, and so what they designed were these intubation boxes that would go over to help uh, seal off and prevent that air from escaping everywhere into the um, room. And so, um, so the, it was a maker basically, um, and they knew that J&D uh, manufacturing here in Eau Claire um, had the capacity to make these boxes. They were, of course, some of their employees were down um, because there weren't as many orders for what they make. And so they stepped up, um, had their employees make these boxes. They got distributed to um, the center where we were at, and then the hospitals came and picked them up. So it really was sort of a um, unique time here. Um, as uh, uh, Lori said early on, all hands on deck. And in this community, it really was hand all hands on deck. And so through that great community effort, we were able to provide lots of different uh, PPE type things to um, Oak Health Care providers. And as I mentioned, for us in this area, especially, it was the um, nursing homes that especially were having issues. They didn't have the supply chain that the hospitals did um, in order to get face shields and things like that. So they really relied on us uh, for that protection. Next slide, please. And so this really was, as I mentioned, uh, a, a big team effort here beyond just the university, just beyond our center, but uh, community-wide. Thanks. All right. So then for our final speaker today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lennon Rogers. Dr. Rogers is the director of the Granger Engineering Design Innovation Lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which includes a makerspace, machine shop, and a set of interdisciplinary design programs. So since March 2020, he has initiated multiple COVID-19 related design and manufacturing projects with UW Health, the UW Madison College of Engineering, Midwest Prototyping, Delve, and others. And today, Dr. Rogers will be speaking on fighting COVID-19 through engineering design and innovation. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Rogers. Please take it away. All right, can everyone hear me okay? We can. All right, sounds good. Um, yeah, could you go to the next slide, please? So I'll be talking about um, three key projects, but um, I'll also highlight some of the other projects that were going on at the same time, either ones I was directly involved with um, and or just going on in the College of Engineering. So the, the first one is shown on the left there. Um, that was a Badger Shield. Um, it's called the Badger Shield as a face shield. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that, but that's this one here. And it's hard to estimate because we had a slightly different model, which I'll talk about um, with um, how we uh, you know made partnerships in manufacturing. but. Uh, estimated about 40 million of those uh, face shields have been made through the open source design. Um, the next one uh, was called the Badger Shield Plus, um, and it's essentially a very similar face shield design with uh, some halyard uh, fabric underneath. And then it has an optional magnetically mounted uh, fan blower that goes on the inside, and then there's a battery and um, a controller on the back. And about 100,000 of those um, have been made and sold. And then the final one um, that I would say had the largest impact, and that's kind of why I mentioned these three, um, is called the Badger Seal. Um, and initially about 10,000 have been made, but actually um, I can update a little bit that about 25,000 of them probably have been made uh, just due to uh, some new information from the CDC. Um, and the Badger Seal is um, an, a, a way of sealing um, a normal uh, three-ply disposable mask. So if you go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we had a lot of other projects and a lot of people involved, and I'll kind of highlight some of those, but I just wanted to blast you with a very gory slide of uh, indicating that there were a lot of other projects. I just wanted to highlight, and I'll talk about um, the few that um, have been made uh, in the most uh, high, you know, the largest quantities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, all along, I'll kind of highlight our role, and it was pretty similar with all of them. So our primary role was to iteratively design, if you go to the next one, 
uh, prototype next, test with users, and kind of go in that iterative loop. And we were always in close collaboration um, with a manufacturing partner and most often with UW Health, but I'll mention at the end, uh, we started working more with other partners um, with certain projects. Next slide. Um, the result was an open source design uh, ready to be mass produced um, by one or more manufacturer or a do it yourself or really anyone that wanted to. Um, and so, like I said, after going through that iterative process, the goal was always to come up with an open source design. So again, that's kind of in contrast um, with what we just heard about with Douglas, which is a neat other model, which is more where you're kind of working in, in more of a community. We were really trying to, to really create a, a product that could be mass produced um, um, by anyone, uh, mostly from factories. Um, but it all really started for me, and uh, people kind of mentioned their starting story. This is very uh, brief for me. Um, but I received an email on March 16th, and uh, it was from the hospital, and it said, we are in desperate need of PPE, and could you make a thousand face shields as soon as possible? Um, so I won't give you the whole story, but um, my wife's an anesthesiologist at UW, and so I went home to her and was like, is this a legitimate request? Um, those of us that um, do design and innovation, we all have requests every once in a while for, hey, can you make this thing? And um, so that kind of kicked off um, this conversation with my wife and she pretty much confirmed it. She, you know, she mentioned that she had some concerns and that um, there certainly was the risk. So it became you know, partly personal, like I think it was for all of us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and there were good reasons why they reached out to me uh, individually um, is that I oversee the lab called the Design Innovation Lab. And it's all the prototyping and design both the facilities and programs within the College of Engineering. So we have you know, 3D printing, metal work, electronics, uh, wood tools, 3D scanning, and so on and so on. So we, we are really the home for all that. So um, we are really meant for that request. So um, you know, it really kicked off this, uh, this uh, fun adventure. Next slide. Um, so what, it, what the next thing I did um, pretty much the next day was reach out um, in the network here in Madison and um, two companies and, and, and some of them I knew uh, personally already, uh, some at uh, Midwest Prototyping, which is a really great uh, rapid prototyping, but it, they do a you know, large scale um, 3D printing largely um, for uh, many companies around the world. So I reached out to them and I reached out to uh, Delve, uh, formerly called Design Concepts. Um, and then I also started collecting materials and um, I had a picture there of the craft store um, as a lot of us experienced, you know, it was, it was uh, time to go and create some prototypes. So next slide. Um, as I mentioned, I'll kind of skip over the details, but what resulted it was uh, the Badger's uh, shield and it was a very simple design and we kind of restricted ourselves actually not to use 3D printers. Uh, we all loved all the, Jesse Darley and, and Brian Ellison were the, the two collaborators. And we really love 3D printing, as I mentioned, uh, Midwest prototyping, that's kind of the, one of their core competencies. Um, but we came up with a simple design. Um, it, it could be mass produced. There were no specialized equipment uh, needed, scissors, household items. Uh, the materials were easy to source. It was comfortable, low cost, um, and it really improved upon what the hospitals currently used. So next slide. And beyond the design, we, uh, we really needed to create these uh, three bridges. So one bridge was manufacturers to open to connecting manufacturers to an available open source design. Next, uh, manufacturers to a supply chain for materials and manufacturers to hospitals, so to customers. So not only did we, were we involved with the design, we also were involved with these other aspects, which I'll talk about briefly. So next slide. So here's an example of the open source design. It has the engineering drawings in it. It has some step-by-step -step directions. Um, and then we made it a website. And this is for the this is just for the face shield, but it was all kind of the, similar for all the other uh, projects. So next slide. In terms of supply chain, um, as everyone mentioned, materials were extremely difficult to obtain. So the face shield had uh, three pretty simple materials, but it still was difficult for people to find those materials. So if a manufacturer was interested in making them, um, we had a hub on our website where uh, suppliers could put their information and manufacturers could find it um, to find those materials. So we basically established what was uh, you know called a pop up supply chain. So next slide. Um, and then the, lastly, we wanted to connect manufacturers to hospitals. Um, so if manufacturers were making face shields, connecting uh, them to hospitals uh, in need. Um, and so this was an effort uh, led largely by another faculty member here in the College of Engineering, uh, Justin Boutlier. Um, and the Wall Street Journal wrote an article on it. It was really interesting. And again, it was kind of called this pop-up supply chain. And next slide. Um, the Badger Shield design went viral, um, I think. It 
could be considered to do that. Um, and it evolved quite rapidly. So both globally and local manufacturing took off. Um, Ford made, ended up making 20 million of them. Kohler uh, made them. But that wasn't, I mean, that was an interesting part of the story. But I think the most interesting one, which we could talk about more in the Q&A sessions, were the small uh, factories um, around uh, the country and even around the world that were retooling and they were making uh, face shields and then eventually other things. Next slide. Um, here's just one plot. Um, it shows the number of states with participants with time. And in just over one week, the Badger Shield effort uh, had spread to half of the country. So it was, it was uh, spreading very quickly. Um, and we have these both broken out by hospitals, which are kind of the demand for the face shields, and then the supply in terms of the manufacturers. Uh, next slide. And then in terms of participants, we had about 577 participants, either manufacturers or hospitals, uh, in the first 19 days. And so that's what this plot shows. Um, beyond face shields, uh, we started working with uh, surgeons to make some custom face shields. So that's what's shown here, Dr. Benz. Uh, we worked with him, and we ended up uh, actually getting a patent, at least a patent application out of it. So the next slide. Um, we worked uh, again back with Delvigan and Midwest Prototyping. We were working on a PAPR uh, design. So we created an open source uh, universal PAPR hood, which is shown here. And next slide. And then here's the open source design. Again, kind of the just to give you an idea for what the material looks like. Next slide. Um, we worked on this project. As I mentioned, it's called the, the Badger Shield Plus. So these are just some of the prototypes um, that we worked through with UW Health. And then the next slide will show um, the final product, which I kind of have the, the actual one here too. So that was very popular um, back in July among teachers, but it's actually it's spread a lot uh, through uh, the healthcare uh, system. The next slide. Um, the next project uh, of significance was uh, done to study aerosols. So Scott Sanders and uh, David Rothmer and the College of Engineering started looking at classrooms and, and aerosols. Um, and so I got involved. Um, to design a mask fitter um, around uh, the, the mask of a three, three ply disposable mask. So next slide. Um, and that was this uh, design here, which is called the Badger Seal. Um, again, very much like the face shield, it needed to be cheap, uh, easy to be made uh, with uh, household tools and materials. Um, and then here I just kind of summarized, which we could talk more about in the breakout session, like why is it effective and, and what's unique about it. Next slide. And as I mentioned, we worked on a lot of, a lot of other projects. Uh, we were involved um, with what's called the Badger Box. Um, and then we worked on PPE for musicians. We had a, a contact-free thermometer. Uh, Tim Oswald in uh, mechanical engineering was working on an, uh, a thermoformed uh, N95 mask. We worked on paper blowers in the lower right-hand corner. We even randomly got involved with a doc cameras, an open source, low-cost document camera for instructors. Other PAPR projects um, are shown in the lower left, and they're all summarized if you're interested. All the designs and everything's on our website there at the bottom. And as other ones have mentioned, huge team uh, team effort. Uh, this slide and next in the next slide um, just summarize all the people uh, that were involved in one way or the other uh, with all the projects. You know, in some of the projects that I mentioned, but all together, these are the, the people that were involved. So that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions now or later in the breakout session. Great, thank you, Lennon. Does anyone have any questions? Um, you can either turn on your camera or send it through the chat. I can kick things off. I, I was curious, you know, a lot of these innovations that, that you've shown us here definitely have efficacy right now while we're dealing with this pandemic. And what I'm curious about is, have any of them, have you gotten any feedback or have you noticed that these might become the new normal when a sterile environment is needed in say an operating room or, you know, these are more effective um, in an infectious disease um, or, you know, infectious agent research laboratory? That's a good question. I mean, I think um, maybe, uh, especially in, in certain cases, I mean, there's so many different projects I kind of listed them, but since I have these mannequins here, <laughs> I'll use these as examples. Um, I mean, this, the real advantage of this design is that it's, it acts somewhat like a face mask and somewhat like a face shield combined, so it's a bit of a hybrid, and this design wasn't really actively used, and I know that hospitals have really uh, um, consumed this product. Um, like I said, there have been about 100,000 of them made, so it obviously filled a niche. Even, I think, beyond COVID, there could be a need for that uh, in cases where you need to be able to see their, um, the person's mouth. 
Um, and then the Badger seal, I think, is there's some interesting studies to be done um, about um, how this compares with an N95 in terms of um, robustness. So if if you're a novice and you're putting on an N95, you know, normally you have to get fit tested, but maybe something like this would be more robust to user error. So I think there's some interesting things uh, like that that could be researched. And if it does prove to be more effective or more user-friendly in some way, then I think it could survive um, you know, beyond the pandemic. That's great. All right. Well, thank you again, Lennon. And thank you to all of our presenters during this uh, portion of the you know, materials to the rescue. And at this time, I will turn it back to Jennifer to lead the next portion of today's session. Thanks, Tony. And I uh, really want to give just a big round of virtual applause to all of our speakers today. I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for joining us. And it's just such a great thing to see uh, you know, all of the just tremendous response that has come from Wisconsin universities and uh, companies here towards the pandemic and all, all of which directed towards the fields of materials, science and manufacturing. And again, just really thank all of our presenters for their time. Really on behalf of WISIS and the RM2N, I really want to thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the event um, as well as found the discussion to be useful. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help facilitate connections to any of the speakers today or any uh, other throughout the UW system, please don't hesitate to reach out.